Well, despite that uh, extravagantly generous introduction, um, I'm uh, uh, a rather typical scientist in many ways because I'm very cautious. Um, and I wave my arms in an extravagant way very rarely. I have, as you've heard, written several books, which are narrative books, trying to express very well, I hope, what has happened in historical time, deep historical time. Um, but I thought I really would, since this is a, a, a festival about ideas and about new ideas and controversial ideas, I thought I would air in front of you today some ideas I've been having about, come on in please, um, about the history of life and evolution, which are not entirely conventional. So when everyone's settled down, we'll give them a couple of minutes. Um, OK. Well, I'll just tell you a little bit about me first. Um, I've worked for many years, a long time, uh, in the Natural History Museum in London, which is a, a rather uh, splendid high Victorian building which houses the national collections of natural history specimens. Uh, everybody knows the public side of a museum, but if you go behind the scenes, of course, there are researchers hiding away, working for decades to become experts on things, sometimes on general theories of evolution, but more specifically in this sort of museum, on particular kinds of organisms. And before I picked up my pen and started writing for the general reader, I spent many years studying my organisms, my favourite organisms, and their fossils. And they've been extinct for a very long time, and they're called trilobites. Uh, now, this lecture is not about trilobites, but it would be foolish of me not to mention them, since they, uh, I've had such a long relationship with them. Um, they're an extinct group of arthropods, joint-legged animals um, that were around for at least 250 million years. And they were marine, and they evolved in all kinds of different ways into all di different sorts of ecological niches. So um, uh, trilobites, in a way, were a kind of paradigm in miniature for evolution as a whole. In fact, one of the books I wrote subsequently uh, to the book that was referred to earlier, was called Trilobite, Eyewitness to Evolution. And eyewitness because the trilobites did actually have here, here, the first really well-preserved eyes in the fossil record. So this was a book about seeing the world, the marine world, through the eyes of a trilobite. Well, you might imagine, I don't suppose anybody here would be surprised to learn there aren't that many people in the world uh, who spend their lives studying trilobites. And uh, love them though I did, I felt an urge at some stage to communicate with a wider audience, which is why I started writing what might be called popular science books. And the one that put me on the map, I suppose, which was referred to, was this one. That's what it was called, published in England. Uh, under that title, Life, an Unauthorised Biography. In America, as always, they changed the title uh, <laughs> to Life, a Natural History of the First Four Billion Years of Life on Earth. And it was even translated into Dutch, I think, under the title Leven. Is that right? Leven. Leven. Um, well, this was a readable account of the history of life from the first cell to humankind. So it was a very broad canvas. And of course, it got me to thinking about the generalities of evolution. I'd been concerned for several decades with the particularities of evolution, but not the generalities. So it got me to think more broadly, which is always good. And I suppose, as I've got older, I've thought broader. Um, and of course, when you talk about evolution, you have to go back to Charles Darwin. Um, there he is shown as an old man, which is kind of everybody's image of Darwin. And it's rather hard to, you have to remember that when he actually conceived of evolution, he was young and vigorous and hadn't deter, uh, turned into, you know, the very image of the wise sage. 
Um, well, of course, the subtitle of Darwin's original work, Evolution, was On the Origins of Species by Natural Selection, or, and there's the quote, the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. Um, now, often that was replaced in the popular imagination uh, by another phrase, which is the survival of the fittest. Uh, by the survival of the fittest. Now, that was not Darwin's phrase. This is a very important point. That was a phrase that was introduced in a book, a textbook on biology, by another man called Herbert Spencer, five years after the publication of The Origin of Species. Um, but it seemed to be such a neat phrase that it became adopted, as it were, for any uh, instant description of how evolution works. I mean, it is actually much more elegant and in, in a nutshell, to use the English phrase, than the preservation of favoured races and the struggle for life by means of natural selection. Um, so you can see why that happened. Uh, but in my reading of evolution, um, I think in some ways this has had unfortunate consequences. And somewhat later on, I will explain why. Um, but what it does, obviously, and almost immediately, is I lead to the idea of progression. That is, the story of the history of life is a story of progression from one stage to the next stage and the next stage, and each stage being an advance on the previous one. After all, that's what we mean by these expressions. Um, now, that has become, I think, deeply ingrained in our own, well, now 21st century unconscious, and was certainly there for most of the 20th century, too. And those of you who were here yesterday uh, and heard the um, lecture about the arrival of these supercomputers, which will uh, equal and then surpass human beings and maybe eventually kick them into, a, into the trash can, uh, must have realized that this was actually itself, this idea was strongly imbued with the idea of that's the next step in this logical progression. Um, it struck me very strongly when I was listening to those words last night. So what I will do first, I think, is take you um, through what is the progression. This is a kind of uh, insult to the history of life, in a way, because you know, we're, I'm doing in sort of 10 minutes or quarter of an hour what took 4,000 million years to achieve. Um, but it's got to be done. Um, if you want to see what the pre-Cambrian world looks like back towards the beginning of the history of life, this is a living image of it. Uh, this is a, a place I visited a few years ago with my wife, uh, Shark Bay in Western Australia. And those low mounds that you can see here are alive. They're not rocks. Uh, they are called stromatolites. And stromatolites are a living community of bacteria, blue-green bacteria particularly, uh, uh, some other types of algae among them. And um, they don't do very much, or they don't seem to do very much. They're preserved in this particular part of Australia thanks to some very special ecological conditions, which have kept away all the animals, virtually all the animals that evolved after the Precambrian. It's very hypersaline, it's very hot, it's not a very pleasant place for life to be. What it's done, though, is allowed the Precambrian world, the world of billions of years ago, to be reconstructed in a protected environment. Uh, so this is a snapshot of life 2.5 billion years ago. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the origins of life itself, because that's a separate topic, would take too long. Uh, you will have to accept the idea that at least by 3.5 billion years ago, there were reproducing living cells. We can find them as fossils, but they're very rare. 
by 2.5, now we know them quite well as fossils. And many of them are found inside mounds looking much like these tromatolites. Some of the fossils actually look like, um, whoops, like these living blue-green algae. Actually, I should call them cyanobacteria. Um, and it's very hard to tell the difference in some cases between three billion-year-old fossils and those still living. Admittedly, they're pretty simple organisms. They're simple threads. But they have one enormously important property for the history of the planet. To wit, uh, they are photosynthetic. They photosynthesize. They exhale oxygen. They use carbon dioxide. Now, when life first appeared on the Earth, the planet was extremely unfavorable to life. It had an atmosphere with lots of carbon dioxide and probably a lot of poisonous gases besides, also nitrogen, uh, but very little oxygen. Some people think no oxygen. So it was the activity over billions of years of these algae, these blue-green bacteria, that transform the atmosphere from something that would be inimical to us, that would kill us instantly, into something that animals could subsequently breathe. So when I say that these simple cushions were the most important organisms in the history of life, I'm not telling you a lie. They were. They made the rest of life that is still with us possible. Of course, some of these very, very early, even earlier organisms that die in the presence of oxygen are still with us, living in crevices uh, uh, in the absence of oxygen around the world or at deep smokers in the ocean and so on. They never went away. It's just that the oxygen-loving things took over. Well, um, we can fast forward at an absurd rate uh, now. Uh, these are simple anucleate organisms, so-called prokaryotes. A little bit later in the history of life, um, organisms with organized nuclei appeared by a very interesting process of uh, collaboration between different simpler organisms, which I'm not going to explain in detail tonight. And about 1.3 billion years ago, that's still a long time ago, um, the first sexually differentiated organisms are found in the fossil record. Uh, this is one, or this has the record, this is called Bangeomorpha. That's extremely similar to a living uh, brown alga called Bangia, which is sexually differentiated. And as we all know, once you differentiate uh, uh, the sexes, you've got more possibility of crossbreeding. Um, and you've got more possibilities of variation, an inherited variation, and then Darwin and the survival of the, of the fittest can get to work. So it ups the whole evolutionary stakes. So, so far, we are talking definitely about progression, even in quite a simple way. About 540 million years ago, we arrive at the base of the Cambrian period. Um, and it is here that my beloved trilobites appear in the fossil record. Now, it's not... I don't have to, sh to uh, say much to persuade you that that is an immensely more complicated organism than anything we've seen before. Uh, it's furthermore recognisable as belonging to a living group of organisms, the arthropods, the jointed-legged animals. But sadly, trilobites themselves are no more. They died out, as we'll hear, about 250 million years ago. That still gave them a pretty good run of 300 million years. Uh, when we, how long have we, we been around? 100,000? 200 at most. Uh, so the trilobites did remarkably well. Um, these were animals with hard parts. They had the first toughened exoskeletons in this case. Whoops. I meant to point, not move the thing. Here we are. You see the little bobbles on the surface here. That shows how well preserved they are. That's little, little uh, tubercles lying on the hard calcite exoskeleton of these trilobites. If you picked up a trilobite and bit it, it would be decidedly crunchy. Uh, and some animals at the time did do just that. 
because we can find trilobites with bites taken out of them. Now that means already we have another step up in this story of complexity. Uh, there were predators around at the time. Most of the earlier organisms were minute. Trilobites can be, well, the largest trilobites, almost a metre long, but most of them would fit comfortably into the palm of my hand. So a, a very important thing happened at the base of the Cambrian. Animals got large, and they're distinctly animals, uh, and um, they got hard parts, some of them, skeletons. And that was a threshold which, once crossed, um, never went backwards. So that is certainly progression by any... Um, conventional measure. But alongside the trilobites were other fossils. Um, this is one of them from the famous Cambrian Burgess Shale of Canada, um, which didn't have hard parts, didn't have skeletons, um, but were soft bodied. And one of the difficult things about the fossil record is finding places where you can see the whole fauna and not make assumptions about what there was, because some things are very hard to preserve. This is a, an animal called Aishia, and it's related to a charming animal, still alive, called the velvet worm, Peripetus. Um, but the point about this is that the Cambrian one, I, and I could have taken many more examples for you, is, although marine, is clearly related to the living one. They share all kinds of features, not least these funny antennae at the front and little stumpy legs made out of little rings that slot together. Um, now, in the Cambrian, 540 million years ago, at thereabouts, most of the living phyla, the largest groups of animals that we know, have their first representatives. So evolution has done, at that point, it's usually referred to because it appeared to have happened fast as the Cambrian evolutionary explosion. Um, evolution worked very fast and produced designs which are still with us. And again, whichever way you look at it, uh, that is a progression. Uh, but it is one that has set into motion the main animal groups that we have today. So this is moving up the, the ladder of life, if you like, very fast indeed. Um, there were even ancestors in the Cambrian of our own group, and these have only just been recognised in the last year or two. It used to be thought that the vertebrates, us lot, were an exception. They weren't there in the Cambrian, but in fact ancestors of this lovely uh, um, living lamprey uh, were already present there in the Cambrian. So a lot of evolutionary work had been done already 540 million years ago. But life so far was fully marine and in the sea, but it wasn't long before life found its way onto land. Now, each time this, each of these thresholds that was crossed, of course, made for a new ecology. And that's progression, too, of a kind. Uh, these were the trailblazers. Um, this is, of course, a living one, but fossil ones are known. A liverwort simply crawls over the surface of wet mud. But the green pads, which have very little internal support, are photosynthesizing and therefore releasing yet more oxygen into the atmosphere. And as that happened, it made it more suitable for terrestrial animals to follow them on to the land. So that's certainly progression. Now, when you go on to land, you're opening up a whole new environment. The possibilities for evolution are prolific. Um, so that's the creation of a new ecosystem. And that's certainly progression. If you want to see the next stage, uh, something like that. Um, here, we're not just crawling on the ground, we're moving upwards. Uh, if you're photosynth photosynthesizing pad, one way to get it over your neighbors is to grow upwards. And it, wasn't, it didn't take long before the plants learned the secret of this. Uh, now, it won't have escaped your attention, as I've been wittering on, that these 
animals that I'm showing you and plants that I'm showing you are actually not just fossils, they're still with us. So the first qualification to the idea of progression uh, is that when organisms evolve, as it were, to the next stage, they don't, uh, the, the ones in the earlier stage don't die out, they don't disappear. They actually are still with us. They, they have a niche that, um, um, it, it, that enables them to survive. And a few years, the last book I wrote, in fact, was a book called Survivors, which was about the organisms that time had left behind. Um, so this, we already see that the simple idea of progression, of one thing giving rise to another, which outcompetes the earlier one, which then replaces it, which goes on to the next stage, and so on and so forth, is already seen to be not an adequate description of what really happens in the world. Those blue-green bacteria are still with us. They're ubiquitous. If you put a jar on the window ledge and leave it in the sunshine, it will turn green, and it'll be those guys. If you put some mud out uh, on your back door and let the rain rain on it for a bit and keep it out of the sunshine, you will find liverworts growing on it. The opportunities are still there. This past is still with us. So life moves on, but the history is retained. Not all things, like the, my friends the trilobites, of course, but uh, many things. And, of course, the next stage is to support that photosynthesizing column and carry it upwards to make a tree. This happens to be ginkgo, which is another of those famous survivors. This comes through from the age of the dinosaurs. But the tree habit, if I can describe it like that, was something that was acquired a long time before this. Um, I just chose this particular example. Um, well, the plants led the way, the animals followed, and very shortly. And the first animals were tiny little insects, or insect relatives. And, of course, where the insects went, there were things that liked to eat insects. Um, and, ultimately, our own ancestors, most distant ancestors, the first quadrupeds, the first four-legged animals, came from their fishy relatives in the sea onto land. Well, do we have any of those fishy relatives still living? Yes, we do. Uh, the Australian lungfish, Neoceratodus, is generally reckoned now by uh, both zoologists and DNA studies to lie closest to our tetrapod relatives that came out from the sea, or at least on, from brackish water, onto land. Um, well, it does look a bit primitive. It's got no... Um, bony skeleton at all. It's entirely cartilage. And I was privileged to, to hang on to a big six-foot-long one when I was in Australia a few years ago. And uh, it's a, quite an unusual sensation. It's like, um, uh, like holding some sort of alien creature, in a way, because it kind of wiggles around. And, um, but uh, it's a wonderful survivor. Um, but sometime possibly during the Devonian period, more than 400 million years ago, it came out onto land. Now, one of the great things that's happened to paleontology, my own particular field, in the last few years, is that people have gone out to look for what you might call missing links and actually found them. Uh, and this is an extremely satisfactory one um, uh, called Tiktalik, which was found in the Canadian Arctic. Whoops. I keep on doing this. Um, that's what I want. Um, the problem is you know, a fin doesn't look much like a hand. Uh, and when you're going onto land, you, something, you want something that can turn into a hand, if I can put it like that. And that fossil was always missing until Tiktalek came along, uh, which has this rather complex series of bones in the feet uh, that form a very satisfactory halfway point, as it were, between a fin and a load-bearing hand. I might say some of these early vertebrates that came onto land had seven digits or six digits, and not R5. Uh, and if one of those had succeeded in um, 
giving rise to descendants rather than the five-fingered ones, uh, you know, we might all be playing the piano with 12 fingers. Um, it might have been an improvement, who knows? Um, this is a sort of rather odd, flattened uh, animal. That's, what it, that's a reconstruction of it, which was almost certainly a, a predator. So we've already got, really, the sort of structure, ecological structure, that you might say applies today. You've got prey, you've got predators, you've got plants, uh, you've got tall plants, you've got low plants. It didn't take long for that ecology to establish itself. Uh, but we can still talk within the progression paradigm, paradigm of a progression to a next stage, uh, another threshold crossed, new ecologies created. So it all sounds rather linear, if I can put it like that. So let's fast forward to the age of the dinosaurs, everybody's favorite fossils. Uh, the terrestrial animals continue to evolve and famously get larger. Um, and the dinosaurs were simply the top tier of a very complex ecosystem, which in many ways was rather like our own. As well as large dinosaurs, obviously the meat eaters and the large herbivores. For lower down the food chain, there were insectivores, some of them dinosaurs, some of them early mammals. Um, and uh, the whole kind of um, uh, uh, botanical situation that you'd expect today, but no flowering plants. Some of those dinosaurs went on to develop the, fur the feathery covering that has now only recently been discovered, from mostly in China, even Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, the fiercest of all dinosaurs, had a fine fuzz of feathers. Rather take, it sort of takes away its beastly kind of fearsomeness, doesn't it, somehow? Uh, but I wouldn't have patted one if I were you. Um, however, one group of these dinosaurs went on to give rise to the birds. And it had already, this particular threshold had been crossed, of course, several times earlier by reptiles. This is the threshold from the ground to the air, another tier in evolution in this progression. And I've just chosen to show one of the birds that wasn't so lucky, uh, the dodo, as the first emblem of extinction, about which I'll be talking shortly. Well, the birds which evolved at the same time as the dinosaurs from the dinosaurs, did not die out when the dinosaurs died out, uh, and of course are still with us and prolific even today. Um, those small insect-eating mammals, uh, after the extinction of the dinosaurs, gave rise to large herbivorous dinosaurs and large predatory... Uh, did I say dinosaurs? dinosaurs to large herbivorous mammals uh, and to large carnivorous mammals that preyed on them. Uh, the bison is merely one of them. Um, the bison itself, of course, being a, a survivor from the last ice age, um, which did not die out with its ice age compatriots, no thanks to us. Um, and then, of course, we go the final step up this rather diagrammatic idea of progression to an animal that not only uh, um, is a mammal, but is one that has this fabled consciousness and high intelligence that we've been hearing so much about over the last couple of days. And in paleontology and, and biology, you know, we have uh, something called a type specimen. When you describe a new species, which I've done many times, you're allowed to give it a Latin name, uh, which is a great privilege. You can name really nasty things after the people you don't like and really beautiful things after the things you do, people you do like. Um, and the specimen on which it's based is called a type specimen or holotype. So if you wanted to have, you know, the holotype, the type specimen for the brainy, intelligent human being, who would you choose? Uh, well, Darwin, maybe, but Einstein, almost certainly. So that is our sort of linear line of progression from the first cell to the intelligent human being. And I would think that, uh, um, you know, if we'd followed that uh, 
line of argument yesterday, um, um, Nick Bostrom would have said, well, the next stage is obviously the supercomputer that takes the brain element further into its next stage. It's the next dot on, the, on what looks to be rather a straight line. Or maybe it's a, um, exponential. an exponential line. Um, anyway, it's another point on the graph. Um, I don't think, however, that's an adequate description of what, really go, what evolution really does. And I'll now explain why, I hope. Um, if that were simply an upward and upward story, uh, that would be fine. But of course it's not. The history of life has been punctuated by mass extinctions. This is a t these are times when all bets were off, when hundreds of species, sometimes millions of species, became extinct within a very short period of time. Um, most people know something about the, the so-called KT or, uh, event, the, the extinction event that brought around the demise of the dinosaurs, and many other organisms besides. But there were other mass extinctions, one of them at least at the end of the Permian period, still more extreme. Now these were times when all bets were off. The normal rules of progression, if you like, were suspended. Uh, lie, the survival of one of these events may have been a lottery, just luck, or it may have been some quality that, I'm going to put this terribly teleologically, may have been some quality that you didn't know you possessed or come, it would come in useful until the crisis time arrived. Let's suppose, for example, that you happen to have a very, very long gestation period. Uh, at this time, that might prove to be the thing that gets you through. Let's suppose that you can eat seeds uh, or hard food that can remain dormant in the soil for a long time. It might be that quality that gets you through the extinction event. None of these animals beforehand, or plants, could say to themselves, aha, this will come in useful when the meteorite arrives. Uh, so um, there was certainly an element of serendipity in the organisms that passed through. The KT event took out dinosaurs, it took out other organisms in the sea, it reset life, and conventionally at least it gave the mammals a chance to evolve into the fauna we have today, including ourselves. What it certainly did, and this is again part of the progression line, if I took the whole story from the first cell to us, um, I think I wouldn't be telling a lie if I said that smartness, brain power, did increase in general. That mammals as a whole are smarter than reptiles as a whole. Metabolic rate also increased, say, between the reptiles and the mammals. This has a cost because, of course, we have to eat more. Uh, so there are certainly some progressive, at the largest scale, some progressive aspects to what happened in spite of these interruptions. The biggest one, that's not a terribly informative slide, uh, was the, the end of the Permian period, uh, when uh, about 250 million years ago, when all the continents were united as a single drowned, partially drowned continent, Pangaea, and the oceans that covered the rest of the world went very seriously anoxic. And there was an extremely nasty um, and long-lived violent eruption in what is now Siberia of volcanic gas. And the th these effects together produced the biggest extinction the world has seen. 90% of organisms, of species, probably went. All of which, um, that's the ammonite that went at the end of the Cretaceous, not just big, serious things like dinosaurs di disappeared, but some very large, prolific groups like the ammonites. And at the earlier event, my beloved trilobites went out too. Um, well, the one thing these extinction events do, uh, which is the, brings me to the main part of my talk in a way, um, apart from resetting the clock, is they gave a chance for evolution, the survivors, to uh, re-evolve. 
uh, to regenerate ecologies. Now, I've talked about some of those ecologies um, and how they appeared for the first time, but the point is that they didn't appear only once, they appeared several times. And every time a mass extinction has intervened, evolution has, as it were, filled up the gap afterwards. And it's very often filled up the gap with uh, a very rapid period of evolution, almost like the Cambrian explosion, where the ecology reasserts itself. And uh, I think this is the sort of neglected fact about the history of life, which is probably more relevant to us than this slow and rather attractive idea of, of progressive progression of everything leading up to us, in a sense, like the old chain of being, and perhaps onwards to some superorganism. Um, let's explain what I mean with a couple of examples. I can't do many because it would take too long. You all know what that is. It's a coral reef, a living coral reef. And in the sea, at least, that's taken as a paradigm for the biologically varied community. We all know that the number of species on a coral reef per square kilometre is greater, probably, than in any other marine habitat in the world. Uh, it's a byword for richness. It's not just corals, you've got clams, you've got fish, you've got worms, you've got sea urchins. All the phyla, the animal phyla that appeared in the Cambrian, go berserk, as far as species are concerned, on coral reefs. It's a very biologically rich, or biodiverse, to use the common word, habitat. And you might think it was rather unique in present day. It's often presented on television as if it were unique. Well, it's not unique. The, the reef habitat goes back in geological time for hundreds of millions of years. In fact, it goes back not just past one mass extinction, but past four, the first reefs. And at each stage, the reefs die out completely, but shortly afterwards, I'm, I'm using the word correctly here, they re-evolve, the ecology re-evolves. And not only that, as far as we can see, it's immensely rich in each case. So evolution very rapidly produces, fills all the niches. Um, and the natural state of the coral reef is species rich. I'll just show you, to show you I'm not making it up. Uh, that's, um, I hope you can see in the middle there a kind of lump. This is in Morocco. Uh, it's a 400 million year old coral reef. And if you went into that coral reef, you wouldn't you'd think that they might be the same sort of corals that you've got living today. They're not remotely related. They just happen to look the same because they're doing the same coral reefy job. Um, that's a drawing of that sort of reef. And you'll see lurking, I hope you'll see, lurking there, number nine. Yeah. Most important organism, the trilobite. Uh, but, and, but making up the frame of the reef are these corals and there are nautiloids, but they're straight nautiloids, not like the curly ones we've got today. Uh, and sea lilies of a kind that don't exist. And those corals, although they look like corals, and they smell like corals, uh, are not actually the same group of corals that we have forming reefs today. But I suspect that those reefs were as biodiverse then as they are now. I've got probably a dozen examples of these through time. But I'm only going to give you a couple. If you fast forward, uh, to the time just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. We've already had two extinctions between, before that, between that last reef, and reefs have re-evolved twice more. And this is one that's going to be the ancestor of our own present-day reefs. And it's got different corals, different uh, other sorts of organisms, different sorts of snails crawling about. But you'd look at that and you'd say, my goodness, that's certainly a coral reef. Um, all the actors have changed, but the play goes on, somebody once rather beautifully put it. Now, um, I'll take another example. Um, 
This is a typical woodland in the south of England where I live. Um, trees, in this case mostly beech trees, uh, with an un whoops, um, with understory plants here, uh, and ferns and another survivor from the Carboniferous, in fact, uh, forming the ground story in this particular habitat. Uh, you can go around the world and find similar habitats. But, as I think I've already mentioned, this ecosystem, this structure, uh, had evolved certainly by 350 million years ago. Most of us are aware of the coal forests in the Carboniferous period, more than 300 million years ago, uh, that produced ultimately our, our coal deposits that were the foundation of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, and you might say the beginning of the Anthropocene and our carbon dioxide pollution of the planet. Uh, but the point is the structure of those forests is not so different from that of the forest near my home. They're trees that reach up into the light, there's a middle story, there's an understory. It happens to be a whole lot wetter in these Carboniferous ones. Uh, and it's extremely species rich, but not so species rich as the living recent tropical rainforest. This happens to be taken in Ecuador, uh, which, where we went a few years ago, which of course almost defies you in its complexity. Uh, there are so many species there. Um, each with their own particular niches. And it is the richest habitat probably on Earth. But I've taken the richest habitats because they're the, they make the point most clearly. But I think you could, re, you could probably replicate my ar argument with most of the major habitats on Earth. They are very rich in species. And after an extinction event, they restock and become rich in species again. Uh, now, what's wrong, or how does that seem not to fit in with my first account of the survival of the fittest? You see, if you... Pol if, and many experimental zoologists do this too. Uh, the notion should be that if you've got something that's very good at, at a of a particular task in nature, it will outcompete the other species. So instead of getting this kind of fantastic enrichment, you would expect a much more of a one species takes all situation. But actually, when it works out on the ground, when natural selection is allowed to play out under natural circumstances, which I regard these events after the mass extinction events as kind of, um, what should we say, Test cases, if you like, natural experiments. People say you can't do experiments, experimental science with history or historical science. Well, you can, in a way, because each of these ext um, extinction events allows life to replay itself, you know, in a sense. And it replays itself always towards saturation of species, not the dominance of one or two after a very short period just after the extinction event, where sometimes in some rock sections around the world you get mysterious and horrible, boring rocks with only two sorts of fossils in. But after that, richness comes back. Yeah. So this is the end product of evolution as it really works. The huge, incomparable... This is just the Beatles. Huge, incomparable diversity of organisms that we have on the planet. Um, almost any specialist working in a natural history museum, of course, will witter on about their trilobites or their beetles or whatever. Uh, I happen to also be very interested by, by fungi. Um, so I thought I'd show you some of those as well. Um, these... I might say, are silent partners in my story because we know they were there because they have intimate relationships with other organisms, but you very, very, very seldom find fossils. Now, I, might, I should tell you, in case you don't know, that um, conventional wisdom has it 
that the most biodiverse organisms on Earth are the beetles. Uh, but recent molecular work is suggesting that these chaps, the fungi, might actually be even more diverse than the beetles. In fact, every beetle might have its own fungus. Uh, and many trees, anybody that's tried to grow oak trees or something will know that there are many fungi that you find only on oak trees. So my bottom line is, I suppose, that yes, there is a progression in life, which I've described in the broadest possible terms, from a single cell to Einstein. But the way evolution works out on the ground, in the natural habitat, if natural selection is allowed to work, as Darwin said, the preservation of the favoured races results in large numbers of species, biodiversity, and this sort of thing. Now, uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do with this notion, um, but I thought I'd explore it some more, because uh, one of the difficulties scientists have and we've seen it several times at this conference, is imputing value, human value or moral value, to the stuff they do. And generally speaking, we fight shy of it. And I'm certainly no exception to that. If you read my books, you won't find anything about it at all, I don't think. But with the examples I've given you, and many other that have occurred to me, uh, it did seem to me that one might say... and this is a moral statement, that the way the world is supposed to be is like this. It's not supposed to be the dominance of just one or two species. Now, I have had conversations with people, perhaps some of you, I hope there's nobody like this here, but there might be, who've simply said to me, we now are, as you know, in a period where we are decimating perhaps more the biodiversity of the planet. We're putting species extinct very fast, and if we're not making them extinct, we're reducing their numbers to almost zoological garden proportions. You know, come and see the last six black rhinoceri. They're breeding quite nicely, thank you. Um, now, I had a f I've had a feeling as a biologist for a long time uh, that this, this is morally wrong. Uh, but it's very hard, if you're talking to a sceptic, to get them to agree with you. I mean, they will say something like, and I parody, not much, uh, I don't care if a whole lot of beetles go extinct in, in uh, Fiji. You know, what does that do to me? I don't really care. Uh, why should I worry about a small South American rodent? Um, and indeed, extin extinction does happen naturally. So one can't say, let's stop, the let's stop time and have no extinction at all. Always has done. Otherwise, not just at mass extinctions, uh, at ordinary times as well. But I think if you can say, as a, as a precept, that the state of nature that should be is one that maximizes richness, and so that's the term I'm going to use, for reasons you'll understand, uh, then uh, you have a moral ground for saying uh, why what we're doing is wrong. Uh, the right state of the world is this rich one, and we are going against it. As for what drives evolution as in the, uh, the progressive sense, I particularly like a work published a few years ago by a great Dutch uh, biologist called Vermeer, who pointed out that a lot of this speciation, richness, is generated by uh, antagonism between prey species and uh, the prey-er. If a prey species, if a preyer a new, uses a new technique, evolution favors the prey that can evolve away from that technique. He used, being a mollusk expert, he used the examples of crabs that learned to bake through crab shell, uh, through mollusk shells, which resulted in a dramatic increase of spi in spiny and thick-shelled mollusks. The two operating, and of course, then you have a thicker claw too, still, 
and then you get a thicker shell mollusk too, and so on. And he used many, many examples of this happening through geological time. And I'm sure he was right that this richness, or ten tendency towards richness, is driven by these kind of interactions. All right, that leads me to the, to the kind of... Uh, uh, a summary of richness. And when I'm now, from now on, I'm going to explore its implications, which is when I get a bit nervous. Uh, first of all, of course, it's got nothing to do with money. Um, and I've said already that it's the end result of natural selection operating through a geological time. That is, we don't get a one species takes all situation, we get richness. Um, I don't want to just use the word biodiversity because it's much more than that. Biodiversity just means the sum of the animals, really, or the sum of the organisms. Uh, I think we have to work into it the ecology and, indeed, uh, the geology, because a tremendous amount of, the, of what goes on in the world is actually dictated fundamentally by a geological underpinning. You don't find the same sorts of organisms on granite, as you find on limestone. You don't find the same organisms on limestone as you find on clay. The two, ne Netherlands, well, mud and sand, yeah? But they must have different floras and faunas. Um, the next statement is obvious, it's what I've just said. If allowed to play out under natural circumstances, that is, not being interfered with major extinctions, uh, it will, the richness, will rise, and it's not just rainforests and coral reefs. You can turn over a rotting log on a forest floor, which I did. Uh, I recently bought a wood, and uh, we've been exploring the bi biodiversity in an ordinary southern English wood. And under one rotting log, you can find probably hundreds of species all living there in a complex web of interdependence, which is richness. Um, and that's where the moral statement comes in. It's the way the natural world is, and that's a description, and should be, that's my putting a value on it. Uh, and then we'll come to that at the end. <laughs> because the point here, the, the, next, the next point, or the next stage in the argument will be, well, we humans are, of course, just another species. So if you can apply these ideas of, 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 of richness to the natural world, to ecosystems, to, to rainforests, to coral reefs, even rotting logs, maybe it's not so irrational to apply it to human beings as well and to, way, to the way our societies operate as well. Perhaps we in society, human societies, should also regard richness however you define it, um, as a desirable end. Right, we'll come back to some of those points. That's just the simplest possible geological map of Britain and Ireland. Uh, the different colours of different rocks. And superimposed on everything I've been talking about is this kind of geological underlay, uh, which applied globally, of course, is extraordinarily important. So I would add to the biodiversity aspect something called geodiversity. At the most human level, of course, it immediately reflected or is reflected in such things as our, in Britain, geodiverse landscape yields wonderful heterogeneous towns like this that grow out of the local geology um, and which most people find aesthetically pleasing. OK, well, now I'm going to go from my logical argument, which I hope you find logical, uh, to what I call the misapplication of Darwinism. And this is particularly when survival of the, fitness, of, of the fittest uh, is um, uh, misapplied in what I think is the wrong situation. I call it the winner-takes-all winner justification. Um, and particularly, which we hear these days all the time, and this is where I know I'm treading onto extreme quagmire, 
and I can claim no particular personal expertise, uh, but that's what this meeting is supposed to be about, isn't it? Um, I've been thinking about it in particular with a lot of statements that we hear, certainly in Britain, and I wouldn't be surprised here in Holland and the Netherlands as well, uh, you, equating the market as, uh, as if it were a, Darwin, a Darwinistic phenomenon. Um, we famously had a Prime Minister of whom you all have heard, Margaret Thatcher, and when talking about market forces, she famously said, there is no alternative. That's a flat statement. What she meant was that communism had failed, which I suppose it had, and that therefore the other model for human existence had to be led by the market. And poor old Darwin uh, and the human brain uh, have a lot to answer for. Um, well, how does this work out? I've forgotten now. Uh, right, let's go now to think about the market and the corporate business model for the market. Now, I, I just trawled through the newspapers to see what I could find and whether the phrases I found were consistent with this notion of uh, the market must be Darwinistic. Right? Now, if, you, if none of these streaks ring any bells with you, I'd be surprised. Uh, we must adapt or die. Um, companies usually going through a, a difficult time use this sort of language. But hilariously, we mustn't be dinosaurs. Uh, that's used almost as a commonplace phrase for, uh, well, we're not very well adapted. Uh, we must immediately get on to do something new and be different. Well, of course, the dinosaurs didn't die out because they weren't adapted. They were superbly well adapted. They died out because of an extraneous event, the arrival of a very large meteoritic body. Um, the growth idea, we must continue to grow or we'll cease to be profitable. Uh, competition is threatening our market niche, i.e. we must eliminate the competition uh, by usually swallowing the competition up. Now, it doesn't lead to richness. Uh, it's a jungle out there. You've come across that one. Uh, even the language which we very often hear of one large company or corporation taking over other large companies or corporations, they use the words, the language is the giveaway. They talk about launching an aggressive takeover bid. They go out, at, out there hunting and they gobble them up. Um, as for, uh, what should we say, confinement to a natural ecology, the brand is, can never be big enough. It wants to go global. Um, so as it goes global, of course, all that local variation, or what I would call richness, is lost. So you can see why I needed a general term like richness, because it embraced rather more than just the animals under a rotting log. Uh, and then there's the managing director or chairman saying, there will soon be a Starbucks or whatever you like on every street corner, which is unfortunately true, uh, but is also a diminution of richness at the local level because of all those nice little coffee shops that disappear. And, of course, the sky is the limit, uh, which mostly means the pay packets of the people in charge of these organisations, uh, but uh, not us. Uh, so there we are. That's my rather provocative uh, view of the misinterpretation of Darwinism as applied in the market business model and the corporate model, which dominates uh, so much of Western European or indeed global thinking these days. How did it get there? Well, I guess that um, uh, the model in the businessman's mind is something like uh, that of what has happened to our squirrel population. This may not apply in the Netherlands, I don't know enough about it. But we used to have, in southern England, the rather charming little red squirrel in some abundance. My wife remembers when they were on her farm in southern England. Uh, and the American invader comes in, the grey squirrel. Uh, um, it's extremely clever. It's much more aggressive than the red squirrel. It even 
I believe, brings with it a bit of a nasty disease. Uh, it's a much more successful animal. It has done a takeover bid, rather like Starbucks. There's now a grey squirrel on every street corner. And the poor old red squirrel is probably up where you are, up in the sky still, I expect. I'd love... <laughs> where I think we had to go... Can you remember where we went to take the photograph of this one? I can't... Aberdeenshire. Aberdeenshire, yes, that's right. But I suspect this kind of model is the, the winner-takes-all model is the one that lies behind this kind of misinterpretation of the Darwinian process as applied to a lot of human activities. Uh, and people rather easily say it has the status of natural law, of Darwinism, mis misused, uh, that you know, one group or company or whatever outcompetes its rivals and well, there's got to be one winner, hasn't there? Uh, and so I should be play, paid accordingly. Um, what it is, of course, in my terms, is a violation of the principle of richness. That the good state, because I've applied a moral judgment to it, which I'm probably entitled to, but possibly not, the good state is a proliferation of many products and many places to make life as rich as possible. So another working example, um, like the grey squirrel, uh, the end product of the capitalism I've described is nearly always very similar. What it is, is you get uh, a reduction in richness, which eventually relies or results in a perhaps a, a duopoly, not usually a monopoly, of two companies with a very, very similar product that have eaten up all the other companies and then uh, um, have to sell one another on superficial difference. I, you know, this is Coca-Cola. Is anybody from Coca-Cola here? <laughs> no, good, so I can be as rude as I like. Um, the, uh, the point is, these are Coca-Cola bottles from around the world. Uh, they have subtle differences um, they're the, what Coke has replaced what were originally local brands with. Uh, this one, for example, is, I think, an Indian one that used to have its own drink called Thumbs Up. Uh, um, and lurking in the background there, yes, we actually have a Pepsi bottle. And uh, if you, I mean, anybody can really tell Coke from Pepsi? You'll all put your, no? Yes. Definitely, we have one def definite taker, but to, it's two. But um, they are, whichever way you look at it, they're very similar products. And if you look at the whole Coke line, there are, there's Sprite and there's, was it 7-Up? I can't remember. I get, seven 7-Up, okay. Sprite's the other one, isn't it? Yeah. 7-Up uh, and Sprite, virtually identical. The whole line of these two companies, which are the mega companies in soft drinks, uh, have a kind of one-for-one -one correspondence. And the only difference is in the amount they spend on advertising. As we know, the, co the cost of the contents of the bottle is negligible. So that is my, the, the end product of this, what should we say, the, 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 the way that capitalism and other things can proceed to minimise richness. Are there other examples? Yes. I think the wine industry... The wine industry is the opposite. This, if you like, is the coral reef. Um, this was just one small section that we happened to take just before we came here for the purposes of this talk, which, as I've said, uh, I've never dared to give before. Um, uh, and, well, you all know right, wine shops. There are infinite varieties of, uh, apparently infinite varieties of wine to choose from. Many of them are small businesses. Uh, they occur in all parts of the world. To the winemaker, the word terroir, which is geodiversity, of course, is extremely important. Uh, so these are, you know, these are species actively evolving, actively changing, which add, I think, to richness. And therefore, on the moral criteria that I've devised, are a good thing. And, of course, I have, coming to the Netherlands, I have to show beer as well. Um, and uh, 
there has been a revival in what you might call small breweries in Britain, uh, which has been um, very welcome, uh, which is a reassertion, strangely, of richness, because we had a, during the 60s and 70s, we had very aggressive takeover campaigns of small breweries by the large companies, and we were dang in danger of getting down to about two species, just like Coke and Pepsi and beer. Carlsberg and Tuborg have already done it in Denmark. Uh, but um, uh, there's been a reaction. Uh, we now have something resembling a rainforest again. Uh, well, I, I don't have to labour the point. I'm sure you can think of other examples in your own mind. I've mentioned coffee, and uh, you can probably apply it to cars. You can apply it to many, many aspects of the capitalist system. Now, that is not... I don't want you to think that I am anti business anti-capitalist here because as I've said here there is a phase where the creative side of capitalism results in innovativeness new things variety it's that evolutionary process that made the coral reef so rich it's just something goes wrong with the process later on which results ultimately in diminution of richness and that's where I think Mrs. Thatcher was wrong, because it's simplifying the problem grotesquely. But I, went, I as a student, a uh, research student, I went to the former Soviet Union a number of times, a couple of times. And the, you know, the worst thing about it, in some ways, was not the command economy in, by itself, which was another way of reducing richness, by the way, but with the fact that people's lives were so incredibly dull. Um, there was very little richness in their lives, and I think that ultimately, um, the command economy didn't help, but you could say that that lack of richness in people's lives was one of the things that accelerated the fall of communism. It wasn't necessarily just down to Karl Marx and flaws in his philosophical systems. Um, okay, so does this concept have any use? Um, well, I've said already that it the idea to me reinforces our connection to the natural world. So if this richness is an, a real idea with any legs, it should include us. Um, it does give me a base or a basis for arguing a moral reason why it is wrong for human beings now to make species extinct. The world will get a much less rich place if we carry on as we have been. Maybe it's too late. Um, the concept, I think, allows for visions, at least, of, of um, economies, like the brewing, the wine. They have to make money, of course, but uh, they could operate on somewhat different rules from the ones of just maximising profits for shareholders. Maybe they could look at the result of the variety of outputs as a measure of success rather than just um, the yielding of profits. What this boils down to, everything I've said, is that it, uh, there's, it, I, I'm trying to argue for what... Um, uh, Isaiah Berlin, for example, would have called pluralism, uh, the non-monopolistic view of government and human welfare. Um, I wondered just how hard, far I could take it, of course, um, and uh, the answer is too far. Um, but I was thinking about it even just a few days ago, uh, we, in Britain, we've had a long, uh, a, a very vigorous, what you might call anti-religious, or at least anti-God campaign by my colleague Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, various others, uh, who kind of blamed belief in God on a lot of the bad things that happen in the world. Um, it occurs to me that if you actually take the richness view you have to ask the question of whether God does or does not exist is not actually relevant 
the relevant question is, is richness increased by the presence of religions in society? And I think the answer to that is yes. But then you have to go further to say, well, what goes wrong then that turns, and there's so many examples to enumerate, that turns religious wars and so on into uh, the damaging things that they are? And the answer, of course, is usually, in fact, invariably, that one of the religious groups believes they alone or their book has all the answers, and this makes them oppress the others. In other words, they're concerned with reducing richness. So if you apply my principle, I don't care, and I don't really know whether God does or does not exist, but if you apply the idea of maximizing richness, you've got a moral basis for pluralism and for a more tolerant society. Um, this brings us to one of the nubs of the matter. Whichever way you cut it, human numbers are increasing. They've now passed seven billion. Um, it's too many. And uh, uh, one of the things I've also noticed at this meeting is it's something that's mentioned but usually glossed over. Uh, if I, don't th I think we're going to be feeding seven billion people with shrinking resources. How are we going to build supercomputers and take off to the, to the stars? I think we've got more important things to do. Uh, but if we were to maximize richness, it, it might actually provide some sort of moral argument for um, um, getting our population to a, 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 a point where ecologies could really be supported. At the moment, we're just chipping away at them slowly every generation. Which leads me to my far last question of the answer, which is, yes, is it too utopian? Almost certainly. But then new, new ideas, and I think it is a new idea, often are somewhat utopian. Anyway, so just to finish up, I think, um, uh, so there's our model for richness, a rainforest. Um, and here, as always, is the hero, but the hero, I think, is somebody who has been misinterpreted. And this has led us to uh, claim for Darwin things that Darwin himself would never claim. And partly, at least, that was because of the hijacking of the phrase uh, the survival of the fittest as a kind of the, a good thing, a moral criterion. I think richness probably provides a better one. On which point I will sh shut up. Thank you. <laughs>
or no, they do regard themselves as a reductionist, as reductionist scientists. They like to get things down to basic physical, physics and chemistry. Um, and he would probably dislike this because it would be, in his eyes, anti-reductionist. Uh, but I think that there is a difference between um, how a single organism behaves and the way evolution acts out in nature. The literature is absolutely stuffed with examples of setting up artificial experiments where you allow two species to compete with one another under various initial conditions. Uh, the result is always something you can measure uh, and will show the advantage of one species over another. But the fact is, if you leave evolution alone and let it work out, as you did after the <coughs> extinction events, then the result is a proliferation of species and an increase in richness. So experimental time is not geological time. Um, uh, I, I was really fascinated by your uh, story, thank you. And I, to, I was getting great comfort, in a way, from uh, the examples you gave of uh, the Earth, the e ecosystems regenerating themselves. I'm personally not very optimistic about the chances of mankind to uh, to turn uh, in, in the right direction again. But your story seems to uh, suggest that even if we continue our sixth extinction, as you say, I'm sure we'll go down uh, along with it. Um, but ecosystems will recover. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. I do think that's right. I mean, if we, if we probably deservedly don't survive as a species, yeah. there will be a... We've done, poisoned enough of the oceans already, for example, for there to be a big period of recovery. But by a big period, I might mean a million years, hmm. which is not much in geological time. Uh, it's the thickness of a, of a, a rock bed, perhaps, rather typically. Um, but it's nothing if you think of, you know... Geological time. Geological time yeah. and high cliffs. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that those re ecologies will reassert themselves in our absence. Hmm. And, and I was also f further wondering, a, a question for you maybe, whether you've speculated at all about the implications perhaps for uh, extraterrestrial life. You were saying that after extinctions, similar ecosystems arrive, arise on Earth. Um, could you extrapolate that to potential other planets where uh, similar kind of structure, that are sort of a kind of structure that would evolve? Well, I, ca I can only, I can, there's an awful lot of speculation about what happens on other planets, and that every year that gets more as more Earth-like planets are discovered. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, we've yet to receive any positive evidence for extraterrestrial yeah. life that everybody believes in. Um, and I think it would be rather foolish for me to speculate on ecologies uh, on other planets when I've been quite foolish enough about <laughs> speculating on ours. Okay. Okay, well, my, I think I was going to ask something similar, actually. I was thinking, wondered what you thought, why, is it because of our consciousness, which is something that's also come up here in other lectures, that, that is that the reason why we kind of fell out of the loop and stopped being part of everything ecological? And what are the, comp the implications of that? But it sounds like you think the implications are we might make ourselves extinct if we don't. The, yeah, the, the, uh, it is a, I mean, there have, been, there have been phases in human history where the attitude to the natural world has been, and this does sometimes arise from religion, that it is there for our use and pleasure. If we'd gone back to the, the original book on the Age of Wonder, you, it was um, by an, histor an English historian called Richard Holmes, was about the 18th century, particularly. In the 18th century, there was no concept of extinction. Uh, it simply did not exist as an idea uh, because the seas were full of fish. Uh, the, if you found a fossil, the assumption then was made that it was still living somewhere else in the world. The world was, you know, full to bursting. By the mid-19th century, uh, people still had that attitude of, of the profusion of the earth, but they would quite happily hunt species to extinction. And if you believe some of my anthropological colleagues, they think we've been doing that all along. 
there are those who think that the arrival of human beings in North America, for example, uh, resulted in the extinction of the mammal megafauna there, hunted to death. So we're a lethal little species. Uh, but now, you know, this could be the time when we get a kind of a, a, an awareness of how we should relate to the rest of the natural world. And let's hope it isn't too late. But I think, you know, we simply wouldn't have given extinction a thought until the mid-1800s. I, I loved your talk. Um, I, I just want to know, um, how do you suggest that we control our population whilst increasing richness? Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, there is uh, no question, I mean, no, no civilised person can suggest, um, uh, what do we see, mandatory means for controlling population. Um, but I would say that there are... Me I mean, the first thing to say, I don't know if it's true here in the Netherlands, but it's not on the political agenda that I've seen anywhere. I've never heard a British polit politician mention it as a problem, though everybody knows it's the elephant in the room. Now, it is possible to conceive of democratic, acceptable procedures like you know, tax breaks for smaller families or tax penalties for larger families, which might push the boat in the right direction without being too um, punitive. Um, some of the methods of preserving natural richness are, um, well, they're sort of in place, but they reek of desperation. That's the, it's the fencing off idea. I mean, the idea that you have of making the built environment part of of a richer total environment is rather a good one. Uh, at the moment, we seem to want to fence off and declare a wilderness area in the States, for example. Uh, this has sometimes been a disaster. I, I know quite a lot uh, uh, about, for example, the national parks in Australia. And the national parks in Australia, at least one of, one of them, has actually witnessed a decline in the marsupial mammals that they were supposed to be helping, simply because the Australian government, which is not most enlightened in the world generally, regards it as primarily as a tourist resource. So it's not about the animals or the ecology at all, it's about giving people a good time. And this, after a film called Crocodile Dundee, which some of you may have seen, uh, involves having lots of water buffalo around. You might remember Crocodile Dundee wrestled one to the ground. Yeah, so it's part of the tourist attraction. Water buffalo have an absolute disastrous effect on the local ecology there and should be taken out. Um, I just, uh, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people don't get it. And they don't get it on an emotional level because they think the natural world is there, it's just there for them to have fun in. Now I'm hoping, I'm, you know, and it, maybe it's ludicrous, but I hope that this idea of, of, of nurturing the, the notion of richness could be something could be felt on an emotional level as well. Because as, as many people of this meeting have said, you know, it's all very well talking about the number of brain cells and the number of, of neurons that fire per millisecond. But a very important part of the human being is the emotional side. And if we're really going to, to uh, get to grips with these kinds of problems, we've got to engage that through the mind with the emotional side too. And that means making moral statements. Did, did, uh, I'm, I'm not aware, did Charles Darwin talk about the cultural component in this whole... Yeah, uh, I'm afraid he did, uh, and I didn't want to mention that too much, because um, his traditional, his, his usual way of... He did have some expressions which you could infer regarded as, as implying there was a scale of human kind of evolution. He often refers to, for example, the savage mind. Uh, and, but it's easy to forget that at that time, that was a very common way of expressing what was going on in primitive peoples. Although I think, I'm sure, he was basically a, a, um, 
um, a, a compassionate man. Um, so yeah, I think some of the some of the stuff that he did on on humans has probably been abused. But at the same time, you can see that, that, that there are only chances if we if that cultural component becomes stronger somehow in the way we're going to address the problems that we are in. Somehow. Well, if you mean, I mean. I, mean uh, that I, I also meant that. I also mean maybe in, in the positive. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the the the. Um, outcomes of the concept of richness is that the amalgamation and blurring out of our regional and cultural and differences is obviously a diminution in richness. So it would be an argument for cultural diversity as well. Um, yeah, that would be very much part of the argument. Like you, Richard, I'm a huge fan of diversity, richness, and superabundance in general. Um, and you've pointed up an interesting paradox that sometimes when viewed, at least in the economic realm, on which I'm not an expert, it seemed to lead to the opposite, to monolithic dominance of the market by one or two brands. Um, but at other times, as in the wine case, might lead to a proliferation of interesting new species. And I was wondering if this is as much a paradox as that seems, or whether it's actually to do with the, the length of, and breadth of view that one takes. That even in evolution, there might have been a moment at which, if you'll excuse me for saying so, one might have thought, Christ, there's a lot of trilobites around. Any, anybody got a nautilus? I'm getting tired of all this. Um, but in the long run, of course, there have been lots of other species, and so it doesn't look quite so monolithic. Do you know what I mean? It, it might be one of those things that looks on the short scale like a problem, but actually isn't over a longer one. Um, Coca-Cola will go, you know, that's the point. <laughs> Coca-Cola expends a tremendous amount of money and skillful advertising expertise on trying to make sure it won't go. I mean, I think you, pro you might be right, but I mean, just to go return to the, the, the facts of the fossil record again briefly, uh, after the big extinction at the Permian, the terrestrial uh, vertebrates were tremendously reduced. And for a brief period, I think there, it's recently been up to three genera just three sorts of vertebrates, which were free, actually, at that time, for the turn, only time in human history, to walk from one end of the Earth to the other, because it was a single continent. Uh, actually, diversity is helped by continents splitting apart into separate continents. Uh, but those were the basis for the subsequent explosion in diversity. So that was a moment when you could have said... Uh, uh, too many, too many specimens of this one reptile. You know, can't we have something more interesting? But leave it, leave it to play out in geological time, and that's exactly what you get every time. Well, when I say every time, we've had five experiments, but that's quite good for history. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, okay, you get the last question, uh, and then we have to quit because uh, some of you maybe want to call the performance, and uh, uh, and we want to finish. Uh, in time so you can go there. So the last question coming up. Yeah, make it cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I just want to uh, ask about cultural extinction. What do you think about cultural extinction affecting our evolution as a global? You mean the uh, extinction of cultures? Yes. Yes, well, I mean, it should be obvious that if my axiom is correct, you know, if richness is a good thing, then the extinction of cultures is a tragedy. Um, and uh, um, you can't have too many um, uh, different cultures. And the imposition of one culture on another of course, which has happened many times in history, and is, indeed is still happening in some parts of the world, is if my principle is the moral principle, then it's morally wrong. Simple as that. Um, okay, it's just because he's a special friend of Richard Forty that he will have the last question, and then we really will. <laughs> I have more personal question. Um, 
where did your fascination for trilobite start? Oh, well, that's, um, I, I, was, um, I was 14. Lonnie asked when I first got interested in trilobites. And I can say I was, I was 14 on holiday in, in Western Wales, uh, when it, where it rains a lot. And I, we had a, ma a local map, and it just said on the map, the cliffs jut out into the sea, it said trilobites can be found here. So I took a, a coal hammer and started bashing up rocks, and I found my first trilobite. Uh, and, you know, it was sort of love at first sight, really. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are, answered your question. <laughs> well, thank you a lot, Mr. Forty.